Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, your guide to everything love, sex, intimacy, and relationships. Each week, your host, Zach Beach, interviews new experts on love, including couples therapists, relationship coaches, sex educators, and best-selling authors. Learn the best tips and cutting-edge wisdom to better love yourself, others, and the world. Thanks so much for joining us. We hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the Learn to Love podcast, everyone. I'm your host, Zach Beach, and I'm here with the incredible therapist with the best first name ever, if I do speak so for myself, Zach Brittle. Hello, Zach, and welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks for having me. (laughs) Thanks so much for coming on. And today we're going to talk about the relationship alphabet. And for those that don't know, Zach Brittle has been teaching, coaching, mentoring, and counseling couples for over 20 years. He is a licensed mental health counselor in Washington State and a certified Gottman therapist specializing in evidence-based couples therapy based on over 40 years of marital research. Zach is the founder and co-host of Marriage Therapy Radio, creator of Your Marriage Masterclass, and the author of the best-selling relationship guide, The Relationship Alphabet, and his newest book, The Marriage Therapy Journal. Zach's writings and insights have also been featured on the Gottman Relationship Blog, Vanity Fair, Men's Health Magazine, Real Simple Magazine, The New York Times, and The Washington Post. How are you today, Zach? I'm actually pretty great. Today's a good day. We're going to be talking a lot about relationships today and your book, The Relationship Alphabet. And I know something every couples therapist knows is that words mean different things for different people. For example, like a couple should probably have a discussion around what they consider cheating to be and what not to be. So I'm wondering if you could tell our listeners about the importance of creating a shared vocabulary in relationships and how to go about doing that and making sure that you are on the same page around like what saying I'm sorry means, what apologizing means and what cheating means. Yeah. I mean, it's one of my favorite topics, the, the idea of a shared vocabulary, because the ones that you've named are kind of big, right? But there's even little ones like, like soon, I'll be there soon. <laughs> you know, like what does soon mean? Or a lot of money. We have a, how much money? We have, we have enough money. Well, how much is enough? You know, I think a lot of conflict begins because we're just not talking about the same thing. And so it's really important, A, to be able to identify when that is happening. And then B, to do a little bit of the work of kind of knitting your vocabulary together. The idea of vocabulary at, at, in relationships, it, it, there's a, you know, Gary Chapman got famous for kind of creating the five love languages, which relies heavily on sort of a language type metaphor. And one thing I always tell couples is, you know, you know, if his love language is, you know, gifts or her love language is words of affirmation. And then he says something like, well, I'm not really good at words of affirmation. I don't really do that. That's, that's I'm sorry about that. Then I'll say something like, well, okay, fine. But if you met and got married and you decided to commit your life to this, this person, but you spoke Mandarin and she spoke German, you wouldn't spend the rest of your relationship going, ah, sorry, I don't speak German. That's just not a thing. My bad. You know, like you have to do the work of kind of learning how to speak the other's language. And when it comes to some, you know, little things like soon and enough that needs attention, but yeah, absolutely. Like what qualifies in an apology or what qualifies as a betrayal? You've used the word cheating a couple of times. I don't tend to use it in my practice because it's just a form of betrayal and betrayal needs attention, regardless of whether it's infidelity or I thought you were going to be here at five o'clock and you're here at 545. Like those are both, they both need attention when it comes to how are we going to deal with this? You know? So you've been working with couples and people in relationships for a long time. I'm curious if you even have like an example or a story about a couple who came in experiencing a lot of conflict, experiencing a lot of division, and then you were able to get to the root of the kind of language problem that they were having. Like one person thought that, you know, soon meant five minutes. The other one thought soon meant five hours. What are some examples that you might have from your practice? I mean, it's it's hard to pick one because it happens almost every single time. More realistically, what will happen is a couple will start to engage in a conflict uh, or a discussion in front of me, and I'm paying attention to to three things in my own body. The first thing is, uh, what are they talking about? 
sometimes I'll listen long enough and I'll go, I don't even know what they're talking about. And if I don't know what they're talking about, they definitely don't know what they're talking about because I'm actually trying to figure out what they're talking about. I'm not even listening to the back and forth or the, or trying to plan what I want to say next. I just want to understand what's the heart of the matter. The second thing is they often don't know why they're talking about it. You know, if we get into a conversation about soon, let's say you and I get into a conversation about soon and maybe I logged into your podcast 10 minutes later or something. What you may be talking about is the need for an apology or an explanation from me. What I may be talking about is that, you know, 10 minutes is actually not that big of a deal in the grand scheme of things because I was trying to drop my kid off at school and, you know, uh, there was a lot of traffic. I mean, whatever, whatever it is, if we don't have a reason that we're talking about the same thing, then we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking past each other. I'm looking for understanding. You're looking for an apology and neither one of us is going to get what we want. And then the third thing is, um, it's a little more nuanced, but it's the idea of who are you talking to? If I'm talking to my naggy, impatient, unforgiving wife, I'm going to have a different conversation with her than if I'm talking to my understanding, reliable, gracious wife. And sometimes I'm having a conversation with the first when she's actually showing up as the second, but I'm not giving her permission to do that. And so uh, I don't know if I answered your question directly, but when any of those things are not aligned, then conversations can begin to go awry. So I will stop a couple and I'll say, Hey, do you have any idea what you're talking about? (laughs) And sometimes they'll go, no, we don't like we don't, because we all know that we've had arguments with our, our spouses and then when it's over or when we're trying to think about it, we go, I don't even remember what we were talking about. We have, we've had, every one of us has had that experience. And that means we're not talking about the dishwasher. We're not talking about the 10 minutes. We're not talking about sometimes even the infidelity. We're talking about the feeling. We're talking about the impact. We're talking about the, you know, the connection. And then of course, and then I'll say, sometimes I'll say, do you know why you're talking about it? I mean, what do you want? What do you want right now? I just want an apology. And I'm like, okay, well, that's not clear at all you know, or I just want a decision to get made. I just want to know if 10 minutes means 10 minutes or 10 minutes means 30 minutes. And I'm like, okay, well then we need that. Then we need to get to that because otherwise they're just going to take their eye off the ball and bounce around, bounce around, bounce around. And then to the third point, I think there's an assumption that we need to make that I want to be talking to the best version of my partner. And I want to be the best version of my partner while I'm talking to them. That often happens in a client's and a counselor's office because, you know, they're on their best behavior. They're not going to kind of go awry and, and, and act out. And if they do, somebody's going to stop them. That's more rare at home, of course. But I have one couple who really managed this beautifully. They created for themselves something that they called couch time, which basically was them to the best of their ability, replicating their experience in the therapist office. Um, it had a specific length of time. There were specific rules. It began when they were both ready. You know, people don't generally come to therapy when one person is like being dragged along and we're going right now to therapy. No, they know that they have an appointment at 11 o'clock on a Friday and they show up sort of ready to do that conversation. And and so this couple, they created that for themselves. And that was a way that they overcame some of the challenges around what are we talking about? Why are we talking about it? And then they gained some confidence in that they were showing up as the best version of themselves. Yeah. So much important insight that you just expressed. Just to summarize, you're talking about when you're listening to a couple, you want to focus basically on the what, the why, and the who. So what are you talking about, why you're talking about it, and who are you talking to? And, it and that's me- really easy for me to do from my chair. It's harder for couples to learn how to do, which is the work, I think, of therapy, right? Teaching them how to do that or how to how to create enough space to do that. That, that's exactly what my follow-up question was going to be because you mentioned how we all have this experience absolutely of talking past each other, of like you're in an argument and you're like, I don't even know what we're talking about right now. Like, what is the problem? And it reminded me of just a few tools that I sometimes bring to my own clients. One is just meta communication. It's just pausing and having a discussion about why it is you're talking about what you're talking about. But it also reminds me of the importance of knowing like our intention, like knowing why we're doing what we're doing. And it applies to the large intention of why we're in a partnership to the small intention of like why we're having a conversation. So Let's talk about, yeah, that in the moment, like we are talking past each other. There's no, there's a lot of talking, there's little communication and even less connection. How do we in the moment come back to shared understanding? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a, that's a challenge, but it's a skill, right? I think it's a skill. And if it's a skill, it means you can learn it. And if you can learn it, you can master it. 
And I think part of that is recognizing in the flow of a conversation, whenever one or both of you realize that this conversation is off the rails, that we don't know where it's going, we don't know what's happening, one or both of us is flooded, truly the best thing you can do is just stop. Literally just stop. And and that skill in and of itself is one that I think is really important to separate from what happens next, which is the relational work of repair, right? Like you have to actually sort of truncate the the trauma or the problem. And then you need to kind of orient back toward, okay, what what are we trying to do here? And sometimes that takes a while. That might take 20 minutes. It might take 24 hours, but it's literally a waste of time to stay in a conversation that that is off the rails because it's too emotionally charged or because you, you're not speaking the same language. Or for me, there's lots of ways that you can kind of begin to introduce this. It absolutely begins with a sense of self-awareness, right? If I am in a conversation with my wife and I realize that I am flooded, the, the responsible thing for me to do is to opt out. And a lot of people opt out violently. They'll opt out by saying, fuck this, I'm out of here. Or sorry, am I allowed to curse on this podcast? Yeah, um, you can. <laughs> <laughs> they'll say, um, I'm out of here. It's slam the door and walk away or something. And sometimes they opt out through sort of what, what I'll call the violence of silence, right? They'll just shut down or turn on the TV or just turn away. I think that's doing the right thing in the wrong way. I think what we need to learn how to do is to go, hey, this isn't working. Like, I'm going to say something I regret. I need to opt out right now because I'm already, I already know that I'm too defensive to participate meaningfully. And I think that's trust building when you do the second part, which is to come back. You know, you have to come, if you're going to opt out, you got to return and offer repair. But that's, again, that's a, that's the second or a secondary skill once you have learned how to opt out and people opt out in all kinds of ways. They'll, they'll opt out with hand signals or code words, or sometimes if we know a conversation is going to be tense, we can set an egg timer. And just when it dings, it's over because staying healthy in a long-term committed relationship is, is playing the long game. Everything doesn't have to be urgent and important at the same time. So I love to get into this alphabet you put together because you are describing a lot of challenges and conflict that we encounter in our relationships. And in your book, you go through each letter, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z. So it's literally an alphabet. And you go to the very first letter, A, and A doesn't stand for admiration or acceptance or affection, but instead you put arguments front and center right there at the beginning. And you actually do write that it's important to have arguments. And I think a yeah, lot of absolutely. people almost see conflict or problems or disagreements as a problem. So why is arguments front and center and why is it important to have arguments? Well, a couple of reasons. I mean, I personally just have kind of an allergy to just sort of accepting cliches on their own merits, right? So affection, adoration, I forget what else you listed off. Like that's what you expect. That's what the reader expects in an A chapter about relationships. B is betrayal. C is contempt and criticism. D is defensiveness. I did that on purpose to let people know that these things are present. That's normal. That's okay. That's allowed. And in the case of arguments, I even said it's important, right? I mean, the thing about being in a long-term committed relationship is you gain these two privileges that you don't have in other parts of your life. One is the ability to sort of constantly ask for sex, right? Like you can't do that in your workplace. You can't walk around to your secretary or your colleague and be like, hey, do you want to get busy tonight? Do you want to have, you know, you're not allowed. That's that you get fired. The other one is to really engage in conflict, to kind of show up in your worst way. You know, you can raise your voice, you can slam a door, you can curse them out. You can't do that at your office. When I say privileges, what I mean is they're both really intimate. And in the case of argument, I think it can be really important to endure that when you go full cycle, which means the argument comes all the way back around to repair and closes kind of the intimacy cycle. And, you know, that's why we have a thing called makeup sex, right? There's a, th uh, which sometimes is better than just, you know, your sort of Wednesday evening sex that you have, <laughs> you know, that song, uh, business time, you know, I know we're going to have sex because it's Wednesday, but you know, makeup sex sometimes can be even better because it's come through the argument piece. Um, and I think couples that learn how to argue well, they can get more done because the root kind of of the notion of argument is really more along the lines of debate, not battle. And I think when we can manage difference with intimacy and with integrity and with, uh, you know, intention, then we can we can actually find ourselves becoming closer um, because people are different. 
you are different. When you marry someone, you are signing up to spend your life with someone whose differences are going to be in your face all the time. Um, you and me, Zach Beach, if I, if you're different, like if you like the Red Sox and I like the Yankees, I don't, I, I, I don't care for baseball <laughs> at all, but you know, I can, that could be a big deal. We could, we could go to war over that. Or I could be like, who cares? I'm not going to like, I don't really have to, there's no consequences for that in, in our relationship. So that's just the nature of being, I think in a, in a committed relationship. And I wanted to give people permission to th- like, kind of think out loud about arguments and think out loud about betrayal and think of, think out loud about. Uh, in the case of criticism and defensiveness and contempt, which are the s- third and fourth chapters, they are, you know, sort of famously three of the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which John Gottman identified as divorce predictors. And a lot of the reason they become problematic is because they go unnamed, uh, and we don't we don't have space to talk about them. And and I'm like, I'll talk about it. Sure, let's talk about it. Like, because me, Zach, I think I said this in the book. I'm super defensive. I am. It is my go-to strategy. I learned it from an early age. I'm really good at it and it affects the way that I'm in relationship with people. And so the more language I have around that, kind of to your common language point, you know, the better I'm going to be able to actually do something about it, particularly with someone I love. So I really love your emphasis on kind of bringing in and acknowledging that the challenges that we have in relationships are perfectly normal. And by working through them, we can kind of grow together as a relationship. And it reminds me of some studies that have kind of shown that like, if your relationship early on is 100% perfect, that is also a sign of something negative happening because it usually means that you're kind of sweeping problems under the rug. Like you're ignoring conflict that's only going to show up later and it's only going to fester. And there are a lot of people who aren't able to say rest in discomfort or uncomfortable situations and work through these things. And it shows up later on in the relationship. So we're talking about all those challenging things, betrayal, contempt, criticism, and defensiveness. And when you, you're bringing up those issues now to say like, yeah, we're, let's acknowledge what is happening so that we can then move beyond them. So once you sort of acknowledge like certain things that are happening in our relationship, how do we work with them and continue to grow in relationship? I have a strong bias for like personal responsibility in terms of like most of your leverage in a relationship is personal leverage. So if I'm in conflict with you or if I'm in conflict with my wife, um, I can, I can spend a lot of time trying to fix her or change her and even us, right? I could probably spend a lot of time trying to change us, but the reality is if I'm focused on changing me or on maturing, I, I, I prefer mature to change me and my approach, I'm going to get more traction in with the way the relationship's going to go. I have a benefit though, of having been married like almost 24 years. So I've done everything wrong, everything wrong you can possibly imagine <laughs> I have, I've have already done. But I also understand that like, Time again is relative. Like soon, or I've been married a long time is relative. Um, in my case, I don't happen to get freaked out about an afternoon's uh, a problem that we had in the afternoon, or even a, a, a stressful week that we had, or a disconnected month, because I have I have a, the benefit of putting it into you know the, a, a larger context of twenty four years. I also have the benefit, of course, of I spend most of my time with couples that are un, more unhappy than me. And so I'm sort of like, <laughs> oh, I, I got it pretty good. Even if I, even if we are struggling or having a hard time, still, I have a strong bias for, you know, kind of owning your own stuff, owning your side of the street so that when you do go into a conflict, you're not, this is a little bit of a rabbit trail that I don't really want to go down, but you're not, you're not bringing and also battling shame, Right. If I'm coming into an argument with you and one of the things is I'm also secretly ashamed of myself or even not so secretly ashamed of myself, well, that's going to make it really hard for me to A, hear you try to offer any correction to me or let you tell me about how I let you down. I might be less inclined to tell you what I really feel because I don't know if I have a basis for any leg, sort of a leg to stand on. So when I'm working with clients, I do always sort of have an eyeball on are you talking about yourself or are you talking about them? Because if I'm talking to my wife about my wife, she has to defend herself, right? Or even just judge what I'm saying or filter it through the lens of herself. If I'm talking to my wife about me, so I say, hey, 
I know I got really defensive when I observed you turning the volume up when I was trying to talk on the phone. And I don't want to be a defensive person. And so I, I think it would help if we just, I don't know, maybe I should have left the room, but also if, if you see me on the phone, could you not turn the volume up? That's really different than, you know, you turn the volume up and that, that sucked because I was just trying to have a conversation. I was going to be five more seconds and all you needed to do was wait. R super different, right? Exact same complaint. But when I start with, you know, me and what's happening for me, she gets to go, oh gosh, yeah, I don't want you to be defensive versus, well, I couldn't hear because you were talking so loud, <laughs> you know, or whatever it is, right? Um, and so I think that there's something to be said for even if it's just sort of Machiavellian in its approach, like it's sort of self-serving and strategic, why not? Why not use it? Because you also get the benefit of maturing, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. I'm even right now I'm in this online course on, on the spiritual teachings of Ram Das, and he just has this quote I love. And he says, the best thing I can do for you is work on myself. And the best thing you can do for me is work on yourself. And I love how applicable that is in so many situations, because absolutely in relationships, when there are things within ourselves that we refuse to acknowledge, when there's things in ourselves we feel shame about, we will project so much on our partner and get defensive whenever these issues come up. I got asked once to write this article and the premise of the article was it's New Year's. What should women know about what their husbands want for New Year's from them? And I I was, I, <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, like I said, married 24 years. I've got two teenage daughters. I was offended by the question because I was like, who cares? Who cares what the husband wants? Like, what do you want? How, you know, what the best thing you can do for him is take care of you, you know? <laughs> like, so I, I don't know. I mean, maybe that's when I learned I was a feminist, but I, um, <laughs> Yeah, I, did, I think you're. I think you're spot on. We need to take care of us so that we can be present and available and alive. Frankly, right for our partners. So I love your emphasis. Yeah, on that personal responsibility. And interestingly, though, your R in the relationship alphabet is not responsibility, but it is repair. And mm -hmm. we've talked a little bit about how important repair is. And we haven't gotten into the strategies or like what exactly that repair strategy looks like. So what are some important repair strategies that you kind of teach and offer to your clients? All right. So two things about repair. One is I am very clear in my own mind and also with my clients that repair is more important than resolve. People come in and they say, oh, we just want to resolve this, or I don't know how we're going to resolve it. And I'm like, forget it. Don't worry about resolving it. A lot of your issues are going to go unresolved. Um, or once you resolve it, something else is going to pop up and you're going to have to do the work of resolving again. I think it's better use of your energy to stay in a state of repair. And often what I mean by that is imagine every single conversation that you have, the purpose of that conversation is to go to bed feeling more connected and less, less alone. Imagine that every single conversation that you have is you wanting to go to bed feeling more connected and less sad, right? Like doesn't matter what you're talking about. How do we go to bed feeling more connected and less sad? That changes the context now of the conversation, puts it within the sort of a different timeline and gives you a target, which is repair. Even if the topic is unresolved, we'll take something that's not even maybe problematic, but let's say that her parents die and leave her a whole bunch of money, but one of the... Um, caveats in the money is that he doesn't have access to it, right? Like her parents willed this down or something. I've had this situation before. That's not a conflict necessarily between them. It's a conflict created by her parents and they weren't going to resolve that in a conversation. It was going to take them weeks, months, you know, years maybe because there's all this legal stuff, but they, they could have gone to war over it every single day if they wanted to, or they could have just realized like, yep, you know what? We need to lay this down for a minute. Let's just watch a movie and pick it up again this weekend when we're both in our right mind. That's repair. So that's a big piece of it. The other thing is in terms of strategies, I think there's a ton, right? Tons and tons and tons of strategies. I love repair because the most effective strategies take place between couples who come up with strategies that are unique to themselves. They come up with creative ways to handle it. So couch time is a really good example of a repair strategy that worked specifically for that couple that may not work for another couple. But I'm happy to tell people about it. They might not ever implement it, but at least it gives them an idea that we can take this into our own hands. But to your question, my favorite repair uh, of all time is when uh, I'll slap my head. They go, uh, we did it again. Oh my gosh, <laughs> we're doing it again. Look at us. Look how dumb we are. Look at what we are doing to us. We need to get back and get paired and figure out what's really going on here. What are we really talking about? And why are we really talking about it? And oh gosh, right now, neither one of us is in our best brains. Why don't we wait and see what we can do about this issue that's plaguing us? 
I really love that insight that repair is more important than resolve. And I know you come from Gottman and one of the biggest research pieces I found from Gottman, and I forget the exact percentage, I want to say it's like 50 or 60% of basically conflicts will never be resolved. Yeah, it's two thirds. It's about 66%. Yeah. Which is to me is like, is like, what? So you're saying that I'm going to be dealing with the same conflict with my partner for the rest of our lives? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> And, you know, especially when I'm working with pre-marrieds, I want to emphasize that. I want to be like, hey, listen, the stuff that right now that you think is maybe kind of cute and you can train it out of him or train it out of her, you're not gonna, it's going to be there forever. And sometimes that's really discouraging for people. Sometimes it's encouraging. If it's encouraging, it's encouraging in this way, which is if we break up and we find a new partner, or if I find a new partner, ratio is going to stay the same. In that old relationship, I may have been the introvert to her extrovert, but in the new relationship, maybe now I'm the extroverted one. The ratio is going to be there. What you have to do is kind of two things. One is uh, the work of knowing what these perpetual issues are, kind of really paying attention. And some of them are just straight up cultural. I was raised in Boston. You were raised in New York. So I like the Red Sox and you like the Yankees. Like that's just a thing. That doesn't have to be a problem. That can just be a difference. Some of them are, uh, let's call it biological. I'm a boy, you're a girl, or I'm an introvert, you're an extrovert, whatever. Some of it, I'm messy, you're neat. Some of it's I'm defensive and you're critical. Who knows? I mean, the list could be whatever, but identifying that is really important so that particularly in the pre-married situation, you can decide whether any of this is deal breakers. And as far as I know, there's really only one pure deal breaker, which is I'm a hundred percent sure I don't want children versus I'm a hundred percent sure I do want children. That is irreconcilable. Beyond that, there is, there's always room for compromise or at least deeper understanding. And that may not mean that your sort of DNA changes or your, your sort of your point of view changes, but it can mean that we don't let this be a super big deal. Yeah, I absolutely love that. You know, I feel like so much conflict in relationships is just like, well, if you were just like me, we wouldn't have this problem. Like, if you thought the way I thought, if you wanted what I want. And no one wants to date themselves, right? We want to experience the difference of another person. And it's that gender, cultural, biological, that brings that level of excitement and growth to our lives. Totally. Yeah. So I want to move to the end of the alphabet. And unfortunately, Z is not for the best name ever, Zach, which is really, really too bad. But you actually give two Zs, and I'm probably going to butcher this pronunciation, but the first Z is the Zygernick effect. And you're just going to have to explain to our listeners what the Zygernick effect is. Yeah, the first Z is the Zygarnik effect. Um, and it's named after a woman named Blueman Zygarnik. And it basically, the shortest version of it is, the Zygarnik effect is the, the, the fact that our brain... Our brains allocate cognitive room or our brains hold on to information that hasn't found a place to go. It's why we think about television shows with cliffhangers because the car was careening toward the cliff and then, you know, it faded to black and we have to watch next week because my brain doesn't know what to do with whether or not this, this lady is going to get rescued or fall off a cliff. In relationships, it's generally, there's something that happened in our relationship. There's a problem and I can't let it go. Meanwhile, my partner's like, why are you still bringing this up? Why are you still bringing, we've talked about this a hundred times. We've all been in that situation too. Well, the reality is that we need to find a way to take that problem, that issue and put it where it needs to go. And that's the work of processing an argument or processing an event in a way that helps us kind of lay it down. And, you know, there's all kind of like, oh, it's in the past. It doesn't matter or forgive and forget or blah, blah, blah. But the reality is sometimes it's just brain science, which basically means my brain is not going to let go of this until, you know, we achieve repair. Maybe that's where a therapist can help, or maybe just the skill building can help. So really amazing effects. And I love your bringing in of science and research into your uh, practice and into your wisdom. And you've been working for a long time in marriage therapy and with your almost basically two decades of work, you have a newer book, The Marriage Therapy Journal, which came out last year, right before everything, the whole world, we know, went crazy. And uh, which to me is basically kind of like having a therapist in a book. You have people ask questions and then grade themselves. So just tell the listeners, like, uh, this isn't a book that you read uh, front to back. How do they navigate this book? Well, I, I don't mind saying I love this book. I think it's a terrific book and I'm, it doesn't really, I'm not trying to sell it because I think I make $3 or something every time somebody buys it. But I think I use it all the time with my clients. Um, it's easy for me because I wrote it and I know exactly what it means, but um, I'll take a chapter 
there's a chapter on repair that I can just sort of send a client if we've had that conversation, the same one you and I have had. But I think it's for couples that can't find time. Actually, let me put it this way. I think it's great in this way, which is I, I don't think therapy is all that effective. I don't think therapy works. I think couples work. Therapy is just a resource that couples can use to help them achieve the goals that they have. Sometimes a podcast can do that. Sometimes a workshop can do that. Sometimes finding the right book can do that. And I just, this one kind of marches you through the sort of the trajectory of a typical therapy engagement. I, I, I think it's clever. I think it's funny. I think it's helpful. I think, but I think when couples use it, they find themselves gaining wisdom and insight that they didn't have before. And if they use that wisdom and insight, they can go to bed feeling more connected and less sad. I mean, I think that's just the, the basis of it. So the principles are sort of universal and I really, I'm really proud of it. And I hope that, I hope people are uh, using it uh, toward achieving the goals that they have for their own relationship. It is a really wonderful book and it is very straightforward and helpful in helping people kind of experience what it's like to have a therapist ask questions and to kind of come up with insight and understanding of our relationships. And you even have a chapter on redefining intimacy. And I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit more about that. Like, what should we think of intimacy as and how can we go about cultivating it? Yeah. So when people come in and they talk to me about intimacy, that's often code for sex. And even if they say physical intimacy, they're still talking about sex. For some reason, Americans are not all that excited to talk about sex or they have a little bit more of a sort of embarrassment about it. But that's kind of gone away for me um, through the years. But um, I also have come to appreciate that intimacy and intercourse are really different. And that intimacy, if you're really going to have it, includes sexual intimacy for sure, but also includes physical intimacy, which is different. And then intellectual intimacy, emotional intimacy, and spiritual intimacy. A lot of people are, they kind of, maybe they get anxious about spiritual intimacy because they think it's religious, but it's not. It's just about kind of the goals that you have, uh, long-term goals or values that you share. The thing I think is interesting is a lot of couples will talk about how they want to work on their relationship. And I, I will push back because I'm like, okay, but what does that mean? If you're working on bench pressing your body weight, we know what that means. We know you go in and you can do a hundred pounds, but you weigh 180 pounds, you know, um, which means you have to figure out how to like increase your capacity to do 110. And then maybe you need to work on your form or maybe you're not hydrated enough or your diet isn't helping you out or whatever. It's very clear what you're working on when you're trying to bench press your body weight. It's less clear what you're working on when you're trying to work on your relationship, which is why I think redefining intimacy can be really helpful. If, for example, you take those five categories, emotional, intellectual, physical, sexual, and spiritual, and you sort of give yourself a rank, like on a scale of one to six, in our relationship, we're we're connected at a four emotionally. We're connected at a three intellectually. Physically, we're at a six because we're really comfortable with each other's presence. Sexually, maybe it's more like a two. And then spiritually, it's a four. Well, now you have a something to measure, right? You have and you can average those numbers together or you can split them up. You can be his and hers or his and his or hers and hers, whatever your your your, your kind of construct of your relationship is. And um, but now I know what to work on, which is to go, oh, oh, I'm not all that emotionally connected. And so when do I feel more emotionally connected? Gosh, I feel emotionally connected when, when we check in at the end of every day. Well, maybe we should do that more. We can drive that two up. I think a lot of people get discouraged because they want to go from two to six in a hurry, and that can keep them from doing anything at all. But what you need to focus on is going from two to like two and a quarter or two to three maybe, but we can't go from two to six right away. And maybe emotional is a little too hard to work on right now. So let's focus on uh, spiritual, you know, let's, let's sit down with our checkbook and figure out where we want to give some money away so that we can lean into our, our, our shared value of generosity, you know, like maybe that's what's needed to feel more intimate right now. Um, so that's what I mean by redefining it. And then also I have a little bit of a mathematician in me, so I want to figure out how to give people something to measure. Yeah, I'm also imagining like different couples will have those levels, be it different priorities and also like at different times in the relationship. Like maybe at the beginning of the relationship, you're much more focused on like the physicality. But then when the kids are around, and you can't be as physically close, then the focus is more on emotional and intellectual. And then it almost becomes just like a formula for like, where do we where are we right now and where do we want to be? Yeah, totally. Well, I've been married for 24 years, but I've probably been in five different marriages. <laughs> you know, all to the same person, but like we, it's phases, man. You got to navigate phases. And 
we're creeping up on another win. I mean, my kids are 14 and 18. One of them's going to college this year. And then, you know, we'll have a little bit more, but that that's going to be a whole new, well, that'll actually be a whole new phase, right? Having one kid at home instead of two, and then there's empty nesting and blah, blah, blah. So I think that there's a, you know, just something to be paying attention to about all that. So thank you so much, Zach, for coming onto the show and sharing us this lovely alphabet and also your new project on the therapy journal. And I'd love to finish by asking you a question I like to ask all of my guests, which is quite simply, what do you wish everyone knew about love? Oh, gosh, I'd probably say two things. One is this is love and life, I think, but it's the idea that sort of slow and steady wins the race, right? This is the tortoise's game, not the hare's. And then the second one would probably be that it's, it really is a choice. It's a choice, I suppose, like the tortoise to put sort of one foot in front of the other consistently over time in order to do the sort of the work of love rather than kind of, I don't know, just sort of expect it to happen to you. So that'd be my, that's my answer. No, absolutely. I wholeheartedly agree. So thanks so much for coming on. Your two books are The Relationship Alphabet and The Marriage Therapy Journal. I encourage all of our listeners to check those out. And for our listeners who want to learn more about you, how can they find you? You can find me and my private practice at ZachBrittle.com. And then with my co-host, Laura Heck, we have a weekly podcast called Marriage Therapy Radio. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your wisdom and intensive experience in the world of couples therapy. And thank you listeners for listening to the show. We hope you remember to own your own stuff, take personal responsibility for the work that you need to do in relationships. Remember to take a break in arguments. It's a waste of time to stay in a conversation that is off the rails, but it's more important to build trust through repair and coming back. And remember that repair is more important than resolve. And think about the long-term love that you are creating with your partner. Slow and steady wins the race. If you want to learn more about me, you can head to zachbeach.com and learn more about the show at theheartcenter.com. Thanks again, Zach. Yeah, thank you, Zach. (laughs) See you later. Thanks again for listening to the Learn to Love podcast. To learn more about the show and your host, head over to ZachBeach.com or TheHeartCenter.com. You can also follow Zach on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram.